The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, O Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Welcome to Majesty. My name is Ron McKinney and I'm pastor of Kinsey Drive Baptist Church in Dalton, Georgia. We welcome you each week to this special program that we have in which we give you something from the Word of God. We are dependent upon the Word of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That was the response of the Lord Jesus Christ when Satan came to him and tempted him. And so for us as believers in Jesus Christ, the Word of God is for us something that helps us and prepares us and uh, is something that we can go to in time of need to encourage us in every situation we might be in. Before I came today to uh, bring this program to you, I spoke to a dear friend of mine in which her husband is being taken to the hospital as we speak here. And uh, he is, uh, apparently there's something going on. He's going to MD Anderson in Houston. And I spoke to her and I told her, I said, you know, uh, these are the times we know that God has prepared us through the various trials and tests that we've gone through. You know, every test that you have, every trial is given for a purpose. And that purpose is that it prepares us and it causes us to be more conformed into the likeness, into the image of our Savior Jesus Christ that we are more dependent upon Him. We look to Him, we turn to Him, and we trust Him, and we lean upon Him. I was pleased that her response was, she says, I know that this is exactly what we're doing is we're leaning upon the Lord. I remember a number of years ago, in fact, it's probably been 25 years ago, I went to uh, the hospital in Erlanger in Chattanooga and her daughter had been in a terrible automobile accident and was intensive care. She had brain damage or brain injury or head and they had to relieve the pressure. Uh, they did several things. It was an amazing thing. And uh, she was able to recover. In fact, she fully recovered. She went to college, she got a degree. She's a school teacher even today. She's had a family. And it's amazing what, what happens and how God works in that. But during that time, I remember how she struggled again with being able to look to God and trust Him with every moment because it was, it was touch and go there. But God brought her through. And I referred to that and I said, you know, all of that was preparation for your trial, even now with your husband. And so we know that God uses all of the things in our lives to prepare us, to help us, to keep us from trying to depend upon ourselves, that we look to ourselves or we look to something else. I'll tell you what, sometimes you get in a situation and you know you are helpless. I've had that occasion. And when my daughter had cancer and had leukemia, I remember calling my father and I said to him, I said, Dad, it's kind of like being in an out-of-body experience. I said, I don't, I don't, I had a strange feeling that this is happening to me. It's not somebody else, it's me. And so what we know is we go through those trials, God is using them for our good and for His glory. And I understand that he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. What is he teaching me? He's teaching me how to trust him, how to lean upon him. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for what you've done in the past, but thank you for what you're going to do even in the future. We're trusting God with our lives. We don't trust in our 
economics. We don't trust in our power. We don't trust in our position. We don't trust in family. We don't trust in other things more than we do God. We trust in God because he's the one that cares for us. Well, today I want to take you back to the epistle written by the Apostle Paul to Ephesus, the Ephesians epistle. Uh, this was a special letter that Paul had written. Many believe that this was a, a letter that was circulated among the churches, but the first one to receive it was the church at Ephesus, so it was called Ephesians. But as we read it, we understand that it gives us two basic things. He gives us, first of all, a doctrinal position of where we are and what God has done for us in the first three chapters. One, two, and three are dealing with doctrinal things. In other words, it's dealing with our theology, what we are to know and what we're to understand about God. It talks about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It speaks about God's working in choosing us, and the Holy Spirit coming and drawing us and bringing us to faith, that Christ came and he died and paid a ransom. He redeemed us from the slave market of sin and that we are now in him and we have eternal life. And so we understand that through the first three chapters. The next four or three chapters, which is four, five, and six, have to do with the practical outworking of what it is to be a believer in Jesus Christ. We'll get to that later on, not today, but another time, because it's important for us to know that the first thing is we understand what God has done for us and how he has worked. We understand his character, his nature, and how he has worked in our lives in bringing us to faith and how we've been, been brought to spiritual life from deadness and then we see how it is to walk in that light, to trust in him and be able to go through the various struggles and difficulties and go through the battle there is as a Christian with the spirit warring against the flesh, how there is this attack that comes upon us and that we need to be prepared and ready for that. Then what I want you to see today is I want you to see that we're going to talk about Ephesians chapter 2. I touched on it last week in our, in our study on this chapter, but I'm going to go back and I'm going to give you a little more. I'm a, first of all, I'm going to give you a story that I found, and this is by uh, a story about a, an old preacher, and I, I used to hear my dad speak of him. His name was Harry Arnside. Uh, if, you're, if you're over... Hmm. 50 or 60, you may have heard of him. If you're younger than that, you probably haven't. But I'm going to tell you, he was quite an, a fiery evangelist. He was an excellent Bible teacher. And Harry Ironside, who was, I consider him to be somewhat of a character, one time he was riding on a trolley out in Los Angeles. And uh, there was a woman who got on the trolley and she was dressed more or less, I would say, like a gypsy or what we think of as a gypsy with bandanas and a lot of jewelry, a lot of uh, earrings and necklaces and so forth. And she came in upon the, the, the trolley and she sees uh, Harry Ironside and she wanted to sit down by him. So she sat down and she turns to him and she says, would you like to have your fortune told? She says, it only cost a quarter. Well, Harry said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm from a Scottish background, said I don't like to give anybody any money, especially if I don't know I'm going to get what I, I pay for in return. So he said, I questioned her. And what she said, she said, just, just, just a quarter. And so Harry said, well, I tell you what, I really don't need to have my fortune told. He said, I have a little book in my pocket that has already told me what my past, my present, and my future is. And she looked at him. She says, you have it in a little book? He said, yes. And so would you like to hear what my past and present and future is? Well, yes, and so he pulls out his New Testament. He turns to 
the, the second chapter of Ephesians. And there he talks about the past, verses 1 through 3. Now, if you remember this, he says, he says, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Oh, and then he began to talk about how it said something about, I walked in the, the course of this world, and there was the prince of the air who now is in control of things, speaking of Satan. And he told something of his past. And then he, well, she said, oh, no, I don't want to hear it anymore. He said, oh, yes, you need to hear what my presence is. And so he went in there where it says, you hath he quickened who were dead, trespasses and sins. And he says, for by grace are you saved by faith. And that, not of yourselves. It is the gift of, oh, I don't want to hear any more of this. I just, I just, he says, oh, you must. And he held her by the arm and he said, listen, there is even a future. Oh, the future is that I will spend eternity with him and I will have everlasting life. Well, she went away finally and she ran down the trolley, he said, and she was saying, I chose the wrong man. I chose the wrong man to speak to. Well, Harry Ironside was correct. There is our past, our present, and our future. Let me read this for you. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Now he's speaking here of the devil. The devil is the ruler. He is the prince of the, the air, as, we, as it speaks in the King James. He is the one who is working in the scheme of this world. He has a power that he is administrating. And yet at the same time, we know this, we know this, that he is yet under the control of God. How do we know that? Well, we refer to uh, Job. And as we go back to the book of Job, we remember how uh, the Satan came and he wanted, to, he wanted to do something to Job, but he had to get permission. And we have a behind the scenes view there as the devil comes and Satan says, you know, he says, well, you've built a hedge around him and I can't touch him. And so God said, well, now you, you'll be able to take his things, but you can't kill him. And so what happens? He loses his family, he loses his, uh, his animals, he loses his, his property. Everything he has is destroyed. But he didn't lose his life. Well, he came back later and he said, yes, but you haven't let me touch his life. He said, well, you can touch him, but you can't take his life. And so what he did, he smote him with boils from the top of the head to the bottom of his feet. And he sat there, and as the Bible says, in sackcloth and ashes, he's scraping himself with a broken jar. Just the pus was flowing out. What a miserable state it was. And yet, it was God that said, you cannot take his life. So God was in control. And so we know this. He is the one that rules now, but God is the one that is, is over Satan and controls him. As my dad used to tell me, he says, it's, it's God's devil, but he's on a leash. He can't do everything he wants to do. Now, he has a freedom. We talk about in our day, we say we are struggling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. We're, we have their powers out there. There are things that we struggle with that we don't even understand. But I'll tell you what, God is in control. And he doesn't allow anything to happen unless he, he purposes it. Well, here he tells us what it was for us, our past. Here's your past. Followed the ways of this world and of the rule of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now, there's a term that we find here in the Bible of those who are disobedient. I was speaking to a family just uh, uh, this past Sunday, situation that they have, one of difficulty, but there was a member that they were talking about who is 
right now living a life not in accordance with God, and yet what they want to do is they want to justify themselves, and they say, well, everybody else does it. Nobody, nobody seems to think it's wrong. You see, what happens is people begin to accept the way of life or something. Do you understand that we live in a day when uh, people who live together, who are not married, is not, not really uh, frowned upon by anyone? I, 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 I'll tell you right now, God frowns upon it. In fact, he says of this, he says, no, adulterer shall inherit the, the kingdom of God. Uh, I tell you what, people take uh, liberties and they think that God is somehow going to let them get off and he's just going to wink at sin and just let it go by. But the truth of the matter is there is coming a day, there's coming a day which we call payday. That is, every man shall receive that which you've done in the flesh. It will give an account for what you've done. Now, I know you say, well, I don't really believe that. Oh, but I tell you what, God who's omniscient keeps perfect records. He knows every deviation from his holy and righteous law. And when you stand before him, your mouth will be shut. There'll be no excuses. And every man shall be judged according to his works, what he's done. Now, the only way that you can avoid that is if your names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that is, that you are one of God's children, you belong to him, he's, he's your Savior, and he's your Lord, and then you escape what is called the second death, to be cast into the lake of fire. It's a place of torment and misery and woe. And that's what will happen to those who do not repent and come to God. And so he's talking here about those that are under the influence. He says, one day we were that, we walked the same way. We were, were captivated by Satan and all the schemes of this world. And then he says, those who are disobedient. And he says, all of us also lived among them as at one time, Listen to this, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. That's what men are doing, gratifying their sinful natures. It's amazing to me, this book, as old as it is, 2,000 years old, the terminology that is used, of course, it's written in the original Greek, but it gives the same meaning. And the Greeks were this same way. They were people who were very given over to sensuality, I've been to Pompeii. I've been in some of the places where you have, uh, they've excavated. And they were people who had their own uh, prostitutions. And they had houses of prostitution. And they had homosexuality. had just about everything that you could name. And so he's talking about these that are captivated by their very nature. Those who are disobedient lived in this way, gratifying the cravings of their sinful flesh or nature, and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest who were by nature objects of wrath. Now, I always point this out because it says here, who by nature were objects of wrath. It doesn't say that we as God's children were objects of wrath. We were by nature. Why? Because we have the same nature as everyone else. What is that's a fallen and a depraved nature. All are sinners. All have a depraved nature. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none righteous. No, not even one. We are all like sheep. We've gone astray. We're seeking our own way. This is the nature of man. And he says, we all are that way by nature. But he says, we were by nature the objects of wrath. But what has happened? Look at verse 4. Because, but because of his great love for us, God. And most of the translation just says, but God. That's a great word. Those two words there, but God. That tells me there's something going to take place. And what is it that God has done? He says, because of his great love for us. Listen to me. 
God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace. He couldn't handle it anymore. He couldn't take it anymore. Paul's writing here and he says, who is rich in mercy and made us alive in Christ. And he goes on and said, raised us from the dead, that we were dead in our transgressions, but it is by grace. Now later on in, in verse eight, he brings it out clearer, but he said, I can't, I can't hold back. It is by grace. Notice what he's saying, God who is rich in mercy. Ah, the God that I serve is a God who has riches and pleasures evermore. He is a God who is in every way, he's infinite. He's infinite. He's a God that is, has perfection. He is holy. He is righteous. Those are words when we speak of them, we don't, we don't see the emphasis that they really have of the perfection of God. And I can't describe it for you well enough. I'm, I'm, I'm but a man, I'm, I'm finite. I always uh, think about the fact when I'm, when I'm doing anything, I think about, I, I'm not capable of doing something that is perfect because I'm finite. But God who is infinite, who does all things well. He does all things according to his, his purpose and his design. You look at the creation that we have. Oh, my friend, what a beautiful creation we have. We're having spring right now and things have budded and everything's come out. I have just admired the dogwood trees. We have white and pink dogwood trees and the wisteria and, and the, the azaleas have been out and oh, it's the beauty of God's creation. And in spring, when it comes to life, it reminds me once again of the fact that God is the one who gives life. And here we are, we see this and we see God giving life. But all that happens, it's by grace. And then we we see, he says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness. Oh, my friend, he says, we're sitting with Christ in heavenly places. Where is Christ now? Well, the Bible teaches me that he's at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for us. What does that mean? You need to understand this. If you're a child of God, Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father and he is praying for us. What does he pray? He pray that we might endure, that we will continue in the faith, that we continue to believe and trust. In other words, he's there for us. Now, he's just not a cheerleader. No, he's one that's praying, and the Holy Spirit who is there, here with us is working in the, with us to give us strength to carry on, to persevere to the very end. You see, the whole object of us to continue to the very end so that you can, you can receive that final reward of being in the presence of God and seeing the face of Jesus Christ. See, I have something in mind. I'm, I'm looking forward to something. I'm not just simply saying, well, I'm looking forward to heaven. You know, I, I, don't, have a, I don't have this kind of materialistic view of heaven. I think that's so cheap. <laughs> now, uh, the descriptions are given of heaven, but it's so far beyond anything we can imagine. It is going to be so wonderful and awesome that we can't begin to explain it. The thing that I do know above everything else, there are no more tears and that summarizes the fact. There's no suffering, there's no death, there's no hardship, there's no struggle. Everything is filled with the joy of the Lord. 
excitement of God's grace and his mercy. Oh, my friend, to be with Jesus throughout eternity, to praise him, to worship him. Every now and then, I have glimpses of it. That is, I see something of the great joy, but then it shall be joy forevermore. That's what it is to be in Christ Jesus. I ask you today, is what I'm talking about here, is this, a, are you a stranger to this? May you find yourself as one of those that's in the grip, the grip of Satan in the grip of this world. You're, you're tied to the things of this world. You love this world. You love the things of this world. You love your life that you have. You know, I'm saying by that, you know, we can enjoy things here on earth, but oh, my great love is not here. My love is for Christ, who is my Savior, my Lord. He died in my place. He is my substitute. I want you to pray with me now. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I thank you for the privilege of bringing a message to those that are listening that in your work of, of your ordained that this be the time that they would hear. And I pray, Lord, if you'd be pleased that you would open their eyes and ears and hearts to understand that they might receive Christ, who is the Savior of men. They might embrace him and all that that means. May they find the joy that comes in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. I am I'm always pleased to know that there are those that are watching. Every now and then I run into people and they tell me they're watching the program or they've seen the program. I, I just encourage you to do that because it encourages me to know that you are watching. I'd like to offer you a, a, a magazine. I have a magazine on ministry and leadership. I'd be happy to send you a copy of this. There's an article that I have in it that, that you might want or would be interested in. You can write to Kinsey Drive Baptist Church. That's 2626 Kinsey Drive, Dalton, Georgia, 30720. And you may also call the church office, and the number there is 706-277-3505. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have, and you're welcome to come and visit us. And by the way, we have a brand new website, kinseydrivebaptistchurch.com. We ask you to go and look it up. Until next week, at the same time and the same station, may God richly bless you. <music>